So this is a typical college love story, you know, at Southern Virginia University. Raven Abaro and Janet Christensen met in college. They were both athletes, uh, both very attractive, and he was smitten by her right away. Raven swept her off her feet. She was convinced that he was the one. He's very charismatic. He knows how to talk to people. He was Prince Charming, and she fell for him hard. She came from a big family, big close-knit Mormon family. Janet was a confident young woman. You even see it in the photographs, right? Uh, you see this beautiful smile, you see this warm spirit, and Janet's family described her as such, that she was smart, she was friendly. Say hi, hi. She loved children. She had an opportunity to watch all of mine as they grew up. It's not just that she loved them, I mean, they all gravitate towards her, they loved her. Janet was funny, she was sweet, she was kind, she treated everyone with respect. She made me laugh a lot. Outgoing? Definitely. Definitely she was outgoing. Soccer, swimming, basketball. She was, yeah, she was in a lot of sports and very outgoing with that. She already had a, a boyfriend, but he was very persistent in pursuing her and finally uh, cracked that veneer that she had. Raven Abaroa, he can be charming, he can be charismatic. He will win you over. He will make the room like him. What would she say about him? She was just infatuated. I mean, see, he has this going for him. He's, uh, he's going to be successful. He tried very hard to make everybody believe he had a perfect life. I was wary of him. And my first impression was, why is he trying so hard? But I thought, you know, OK, Janet likes him. This is her boyfriend. He made Janet happy, and I love seeing that. Raven talked about his courtship with Janet to a local North Carolina news program. She was beautiful, attractive. I just felt so much comfort when I was with her. It's the perfect uh, equation, if you will. Uh, attractive young woman, attractive young man. We share the same faith. So for Raven and Janet, it just seemed like a natural progression of their friendship. They got married at a very young age and decided to live their life together. The fact that Raven was Mormon, that mattered to her. Raven had won over Janet's family by talking about what a devoted Mormon he was, that he'd gone and done mission work, including in Peru. She married in the Washington, D.C. temple and always carried the spirit of Christ with her everywhere she went. Life for the two of them began in this small colonial town called Smithfield, Virginia. They went to the local church, they made lots of friends with their neighbors. We're just part of a big family. Raven and Janet both came from big families and they didn't have any family in the immediate area, so we, they kind of adopted us. Janet has said, you know, Raven looks up to you, Tim, as a father. Hey everybody, Merry Christmas. There's this video Christmas card they sent out, and they look very happy. They look like a, a loving couple, the picture of the perfect marriage. We wish you the best and the warmest feelings this holiday season. Janet, what would you like to say? I would like to say Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Raven proudly shows off one of his presents, a new knife to add to his collection. That's my new knife got for Christmas. Thank you, bought it myself. My dad would be very proud. I like to collect knives. Yeah, he appeared to have his act together. I mean, he was young, newly married, had bought their first home, you know, had a couple nice cars, you know, and a motorcycle, and like, wow, this guy's kind of off to a pretty fast start. They decide to move to Durham to take jobs with the sporting goods company, and they find a house there out in the suburbs. But just three and a half years into their marriage, Raven tells Janet that he's having an affair. He's committed adultery. He came to her one day because he wanted to be out of the marriage and explained to her that he had been cheating on her with several different people. So he ended up leaving. And very soon after that, she found out she was pregnant. She didn't know what to do. She didn't want to raise the baby as a single mother. 
he leaves, she's left alone, she doesn't know who to turn to, she be confides in, in some of her neighbors, the only people that are close to her. You could tell she wanted, she needed somewhere to go. She was crying, very distraught, and she, she told me she loved Raven and that she didn't want to have this child by herself. Janet has to debate with herself. Do I stay with this person who has disrespected our vows, our covenant, or do I try to salvage what's left of my family, even though it's a tenuous relationship at this point? And I kind of read him the riot act in a major way. You know, what the hell do you think you're doing? You're married, your wife is pregnant, you need to grow up real quick. He promised, swore up and down, that uh, he would no longer cheat on her, that she was the only one for him, he would make it work. Soon after, you know, Caden was born. In. After he moved back in, according to Janet, it was a day-by-day a, a -day process, so she really never knew what to expect. I wouldn't say that she was happier in her marriage, but she was happy to be a mother. He told me on several phone calls that Janet and him had mended the fence. He realized what the problems were. It was lack of communication. He's grown up. They're going to make this work. Janet didn't know it, but her youngest brother, Mark Christensen, says he had already witnessed Raven's mood swings. He says one day, Raven falsely accused him of stealing money, and then things turned violent. He just snapped. He started saying the craziest things to me, and it still haunts me to this day. He said, you don't know who I really am and what I'm capable of. And I just stared at him, grabbed me really hard, and slammed my head against the wall. I was scared. I was some scrawny little teenager. I've never seen someone's eyes turn like that before, just full of rage, full of hate. Mark says he never told Janet because he didn't want to add trouble to an already fragile relationship. The couple is now back together, but Raven is stressed about money. They go to the church for help, and they're actually able to get financial assistance from the church. Their landlord is very gracious as well, giving them two months free rent so that they don't have to worry about that. But things were really tough. Financially speaking, things were really tough. Raven's boss discovered that there was some unaccounted for inventory that was missing. He had been stealing merchandise. Raven was caught embezzling. Apparently he saw this as a way to overcome some financial hurdles in this young marriage. Raven then ultimately pleads guilty to the theft charges. Raven appears to be sort of like the ultimate opportunist. People like him, they're basically antisocial. They don't really care. And they're going to do whatever makes them feel good or makes them money. One spring night, April 26, 2005, he says he's going to go play soccer and that Janet is at home getting ready to go to bed. And that's where the story takes a turn for the worse. 